What do you do when one of the spouses wants to retire before the other? Brian, I am so excited about this because we understand that money is more than simply math. So a lot of times we get asked questions that are mathematical questions, but then there are behavioral questions that we have to weigh into. And we love leaning into your questions. We love loading you up with information that helps you do money better. So right now we have the team out in the wings collecting your questions in the chat. So if you want us to answer your question, make sure you get it to us right now. With that, Producer Reby, I'm going to throw it over to you. Yeah, we're going to kick it off with that retirement question that you referenced from Seth. It says, is it wrong of me to quit my job and expect my wife to keep working? <laughs> my yeah. wife and I are on track to coast to retirement in about 10 years. I have a stressful job that I want to leave now, but we would still need income to cover expenses until we can fully retire. Interesting question. What are your thoughts? All right. So uh, the phraseology there was really interesting. Uh, is it wrong for me to expect my wife to continue working? Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the expect right there gives me, my, makes my spidey, makes, makes my spidey senses tingle a little bit. Is there anything wrong, though, with one spouse deciding that they're going to retire and the other spouse continue to work? Not at all. And sometimes it is the wife that continues to work, and sometimes it's the husband that continues to work. What I think matters the most is that you guys are on the same page. You have the same conversation around, ultimately, what goal are you trying to achieve, and how do you achieve that? So, Brian, I have some clients uh, here locally who are uh, very dear clients of mine. Uh, and the husband had a very stressful job. And the job was st so stressful that it began to have negative effects on his health. So much so that he actually had a, a cardiac type event where he had to go to the doctor. The doctor said, hey, you've got to figure out how you decrease stress in your life. And he said, well, look, doc, if, if, in, the, in the vocation in which I work, there's no way that I can do this job and not be stressed. And the doctor said, well, hey, maybe you have to stop doing this job. So he and his wife came and met with him like, hey, what do we do? And so we put together a plan that allowed him to step away from the workforce so that he could decrease his, staff, uh, decrease his stress, enter into retirement early. And we determined that she was going to have to continue working for another four to five years in order, in order to bolster their retirement plan. But it's what made the most sense for the household based on the over the the overarching goal that they both had. So is it wrong for this type of scenario to play out? Not at all. Is it wrong for you to just say to your spouse, hey, I'm out, you're in, good luck? I don't know that I'd approach it that way. So uh, when when I saw this question, by the way, what what a headline that, that we set up this this question with. Um, it leads to the first thing that you need to do. And, and this is coming from a guy who's been married 26 years. Communication is the foundation mm -hmm. of a good relationship and marriage. So don't let this be something you you only bring to the Money Guy show. This is something that you, you ought to be having really a lot of dialogue, communication with. And then the second thing I wrote down was this is definitely a measure twice, cut once mm -hmm. moment where you got to get it out of just the emotions of, and, and Bo, you had it made a good point because if, if this is, I, I remember my father growing up worked in a very stressful mm -hmm. office environment where he had a boss that he felt like was working against him, mm -hmm. but he had a lot of coworkers who loved him, um, and and it, it just created a lot of stress that that I think did impact his health sure. and all kind of other things. So there's nothing wrong with paying attention and being in tune with your emotions and saying, man, this job is stressful. I can't stay here longer because your physical health, your physical health, your mental health, and all that stuff is so important. But let's let's get it out of the emotions and get it into the analytics of the situation. So you've got to kind of figure out well, what does the path forward look mm -hmm. like? Um, what does it require for my spouse? What does it require for me? Because maybe you don't get to completely come out of the work game. Um, and maybe you just have to shift and go to a part-time job sure. or change sectors, change careers. Yes, maybe it's not as profitable, but that, but it also means that you're still being productive in, mm -hmm. in some form in this 10 years that y'all are, are building up. The other thing I thought, uh, and this ties into that measure twice, cut once, money's a tool, not a goal. Um, spend time on the why, because it really does, I, I think about Bo telling the story about the health issues and other things. If there is something like that that's just where Sunday night you're chewing on your fingernails, 
don't just let it just continue on like that for 10 years because I, I think that us as, as humans, it, it just there's a big cost when you just bury stuff and just hope it doesn't ooze out in some weird way mm-hmm. through stress, through disease, through sickness. Um, but it does need to be a joint goal and it needs to be a joint path forward. Have good communication. And I think that probably your spouse will have the same concerns about health and other things that y'all will figure out a path forward. And if this is one of those things, because if you're in such a good place that in 10 years you think you're going to be at retirement, maybe this is where you take the relationship to the next level so you have somebody who sits between you guys who not only encourages good communication, but also helps you facilitate all the analytics. And that's what a good financial planner should hopefully bring to the table for you. Yeah, I think a great tool set that you could use is if you've not done our Know Your Number course, this might be a great time to do that because what the Know Your Number course will allow you to do is define what is the lifestyle that we want to live in retirement, What's that number that we need to achieve? And then what decisions do we need to make today to move towards the number? So it at least kind of gives you a benchmark around what the finish line looks like. And then you can begin to reverse engineer the decisions on when each of you get to exit the workforce. Uh, But uh, like Brian said, communication is key. Yeah. And let you know, are you behind the curve? Ahead of the curve, on the curve, and then it lets you know if you cut your you know savings rate down, if you change your rate of return, if you change inflation. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, great answer, guys, and thanks for the question, Seth. I hope that that helps. We're going to move on to Brittany's question next. It says we talk a lot about investing before retirement. How should investing look after retirement? Should I rebalance my portfolio, adding in more bonds, or stick with index funds? Any tips or tricks as I start to think about this? Yeah, it, it is interesting, and we get we get those comments a lot. That man, it seems like there's so much emphasis, there's so much conversation around accumulation, around building the portfolio, around how to save, about army of dollar bills, and all this stuff. So then, what happens when I begin living off of these assets? Well, I think there is a common uh, misnomer out there that, okay, while I'm in my accumulation phase, while I'm building, I need to have risk. I need to have risk assets in my portfolio. I need to have equities. I need to have stocks. I need to make sure that I'm focusing on risk and growth. But then magically, when I retire, all of a sudden, all the risk goes away. And I'm going to take all of my retirement assets. I'm going to take all of my investment assets. I'm going to put them in a coffee can in the backyard. Or I'm just going to hold them in some cash account. Well, That's flawed thinking because one of the reasons that we tell you that risk assets can be advantageous is because they can grow over the long term. Well, even if you are only one, three, five years away from retirement, I'm going to argue that based on your life expectancy, some portion of your portfolio probably still needs to pay for life that is 20, 25, 30, maybe even 40 years in the future. So just because you are retired does not mean that the risk component or the risk aspect of your portfolio goes away. Just like you had 40 year money goals at age 20, I would argue even at age 60, you should have some 40 year money goals that your portfolio is set up to try to satisfy. So when it comes to retirement or when it comes to decumulation or when it comes to living off of those assets, It's not about this seismic shift that I go from risk on to risk off, but realistically, it's probably more about the glide path. How do I begin making some adjustments and making some changes as I move into the decumulation, as I move into the retirement phase? Brian, one of the things that you and I talk all the time about when we talk to pre-retirees, and one of the biggest ways that we see overall like allocation shift is in terms of even just something as simple as cash on hand. Like we talk about emergency funds in the accumulation phase should be like three to six months. That shifts as you begin to approach and move towards retirement. Yeah, you're hitting on, I wrote down three quick things. And the the third one is exactly what you're hitting on is that there is a glide path that all of us are on. And and I think when, you know, when you're in the accumulation, I I also wrote down there's get wealthy behaviors and then there's stay wealthy behaviors. And, And look, while you're younger, and you have decades to retirement, without a doubt, you're going to, to, to push the accelerator to try to grow your assets and maximize the opportunity. You'll see that in your cash reserves, which will probably be around three to six mm-hmm. months. You'll see it in your asset allocation, where you're going to be you know, way heavy on the, the risk profile of uh, equity holdings and the S&P 500 and index funds. But then once you get successful, 
um, you do start de-risking. And you're like, well, why? Because it's, it, it is that transition from get wealthy to stay wealthy. There is a true risk of running up the scoreboard once you're successful, is that once you figure out what do you need from your assets to, to live a comfortable retirement, you have to balance. Okay, does this mean that uh, undercut the opportunity? Meaning, I, I, I think a lot of people think, and I've even had prospects who reach out and say, okay, when I get to be 60 years old or 65, I plan on going from 100% equities, I'm just going to go 100% Bonds or cash? I'd argue that's pretty and, risky. And that's I'm not like, de-risking. I'm like, that's that seems ex- seems extreme. But then on the other side of it, there are people who just want to run up the scoreboard by taking as much risk as possible to take advantage of the S and P 500 because, like historically, it, it's going to get me you know 10, 11 percent because that's what it's done for the last 50 years. What could go wrong? And I always remind people, you do not know how crazy your emotions will feel once you leave the workforce mm-hmm. completely is that it is a a strange transition to be go from accumulator and builder of wealth to now consumer of your wealth and then also you take out your your working because a lot i think there's a coping mechanism for most of us is that when the market gets beat up and has that two out of every decade two years out of every decade where the market goes into bear market territory and can lose 20 percent 30 percent 40, 50%, like 2008. Um, and you're just like, oh, that's okay. I'll just work a little longer and I'll be able to get my money back. Well, when you've already retired, um, I want you to think about the fact of what happens if you lost 40% of your assets while you actually retired like last year or two years ago. It's going to re- just completely create chaos in your brain. So that, I always tell people you need to have a glide path. You need to have a plan that reflects on all those things because – it, you'll not only change the way you look at cash, like in retirement, it's un, you go from three to six months to 18 to 36 months. Mm-hmm. You go from an asset allocation that still has equities in it so you can grow and, and build the legacy and the long-term opportunity for your assets, but you might also have enough diversified stuff in bonds, um, cash, and other conservative assets that you could conceivably ride out mm-hmm. anything that comes your way for years. I mean, because you will have access to very conservative assets that no matter what happens in the world. And, and then also, don't forget, we talk about risk tolerance and then we talk about risk capacity. Just because you're a cowboy or a cowgirl and you have the risk tolerance to, to, to get on any bucking bronco out there doesn't mean that you actually have the time to recover mm-hmm. um, and that that is a big part of this as well so we we try to give every prospect every client and everybody we we try to teach you on how to do this for yourself is that to recognize that there is a a balance between how do we maximize opportunities but also minimize risk and it's risk adjusted that's where the win is and that's what you should be working to understand because you know it's all back to the and and i know that after i did a little research because i was like i've been saying this my whole life is pigs get fat hogs get slaughtered Mm -hmm. uh you know i know there's another way to say it pigs get fed hogs get i can't even remember pigs get fast the way you say it yeah i know but that but it's it's back to the the thing of you can have too much of a good thing. Make sure you, you, you balance between the fear of losing and the greed of trying to get as much as you can. Um, there's a healthy balance in there. And that's why typically when people are successful, this is a, one of the big things that, that I think a good financial advisor can, can help somebody out with is because your life when you get successful just naturally gets really complex. And it's nice to have somebody who's not just done what you one retirement because that's what you're facing you've done this one time why not have somebody who's done this hundreds of times so that they can tell you what to expect where your blind spots and how to get the best version of, of, of everything you're looking for genuinely love that answer oh, fantastic good. well Brittany, thank you for that, <laughs> that question that is so mean why would you... oh i know i see what okay, you did here, let me, no let me, keep going let me, no, let me no, do that this for the audience no, you, that, you, you, you brought it up you brought it up for you that's like a week that's an easter egg for you i'm gonna do this for the audience that was for no one else okay genuine genuine genuinely genuine See, you almost said you it correctly. See, that was Genuinely, for you. I can't say it. I know, right? Okay. That was for Just you. to give you guys, because you're you're here for the live this stream. This is my bad. I did this. The, uh, I thought it could be so I'm recording the audio book. I'm not sure what else you expected Emma, I, to I'm happen, not recording though. the audio book today, but I was in the studio yesterday. Yes. Um, audio and I told book. you, same studio that 
Taylor Swift is used. Hey. Tame Studio Thomas Rhett's used. It was kind of cool Fancy seeing all the stuff. stuff that's going on in this studio. Um, but I didn't realize there are words in this book that I can't actually say. <laughs> it like is two um, of them. Two it, words. Not what did no, you, it's no. going to be. Uh, <laughs> we've only made it to two words. It's not words that you can't say. It's words that you just say differently. I have shared with you guys my success, and one of the key concepts in my book is you don't have to be perfect or to, to be really successful mm-hmm. with money. You just have to get a lot of things right. You know, like you have to be like, it's like you said, with baseball terms, you get in the Hall of Fame for yeah, you batting forty percent, right? You can you 30%. can get out seven out of ten times and still get in the Hall of Fame. So I have realized I I know most of my life I say I'm playing horseshoes. I only get it get it close, get it close. enough that you get to a few points. <laughs> I didn't realize when I spoke English that I was also playing horseshoes <laughs> until yesterday, and it, it is a very humbling thing to do an audio book and realize I do not speak English. Um, I guess I speak Southern. I, I don't know, but I, it is not English the according to the audio book. Southern just comes out on people. a few words, especially. But I, but I will and tell genuinely you this. was one of them. Um, they are not going to change how I say bowling, <laughs> and they're not going to change how I say naked. So don't y'all don't worry. I'm going to put my Brian foot Preston down to original. those producers and just tell them, you know what, this is how I say these things, and this is part of the brand. You just love it. deal with it. I love it. That's my, be my bad. It's all good. My bad. You got a little behind the scenes of the audiobook. There you oh, go. Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> g- genuinely, genuinely. That was that actually close? pretty close. Uh, that works. The horseshoes. <laughs> all right. Well, all that to say, I think we just answered Brittany's question. Just want to make sure I thank you for your question and thank you for being here. And before we move on to Frank's question. It says, my company gives a 6% profit share plus a dollar for dollar 4% match. So it's at 10 plus percent total. I make 200K plus a 20% bonus floor. So what should I count towards the 25% savings rate? Sounds like this guy has some really good complexity going on. So how would you counsel him? Well, let's start at the beginning, right? Uh, Dollar for dollar match on the first 4% is awesome, right? Like that's amazing. It's why it's step two. Brian, you have a thing you can hold up. It's why it's step two of the financial order of operations, free employer money. You have to go out there and get that. So it's awesome that you have an employer that gives you a dollar for dollar match. Well, in addition to that, it sounds like your employer also does what's called a discretionary profit sharing contribution where they're going to put in 6% of your salary on top of what you're doing. So like you said, you have 10% growing in. So Frank has already told us, Brian, that uh, he makes $200,000 plus a $20,000 baseline, $220,000. And he's trying to figure out, well, if my employer already does 10% for me, if I do 4% and then they do 10%, that's 14 how far off am I? Do I get to count it? Or does something with my income cause that to not be the case? Yeah. First of all, um, this is go, I, I always say hug your employer day. Um, but it, maybe it's um, high five your employer you because I've been told that we don't hug our employers anymore. And truthfully, I wouldn't <laughs> want a bunch of people hugging on me either. But it's, um, but it is one of those things. Your employer is, is setting you up for 10%. That's incredible. It's amazing. And, and, and within the financial order of operations, you got to maximize. Sounds like 6% is going to happen no matter what you do. The 4%, get in there, take advantage of that. That's awesome. Your question, though, and this is this is a good thing, you make good money. And good money is a blessing. Curse is not the right word, but it does create additional responsibility. There you go. And the fact that when you have a good income, there, there, there's you're you're further from the the public safety net, meaning mm-hmm. that yes, you might might get social security, but it's going to be a much smaller portion of probably what your outgoing expenses are than somebody who makes forty or fifty thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars. So we want to build that into our plan, is because if you are spending because your employer is so generous, you've let lifestyle creep, expand your lifestyle to where when you do get to retirement you need an income that can replace 100% of what you are earning because you need your assets to be able to produce that or other income sources because you got very accustomed to that to spending that. Yeah. And, and, and it, that could be a problem. So that's why we have built rules into people who have higher incomes. So if you, you at $200,000, I would challenge you to, yes, your employer is very generous, but I'd still like you to get to 20 to 25% of your gross income without the employer 
just because your income is so high mm-hmm. that I want to make sure that this is not catching you on the other side is because if you expand your lifestyle, do lifestyle creep, just because you have a generous employer, you're not helping yourself. You're actually working against yourself in the long term because you're going to you're going to need that money to, to cover your lifestyle and it's just not going to be the retirement that I think you had planned for or hoped for. And what and what's the worst case scenario? You you save your 25% and then your employer also puts in 10%. So you're at 35% of your total wages going in. You might have options earlier in life than you would have otherwise. You might be able to take your foot off the pedal as you do get into your 40s or 50s or maybe Early retirement is something that is realistically on your horizon, but I think that's something that can be a welcome surprise when you get there, not something that you plan for on the very front end. Yeah, I mean, when you own your time sooner, that's that's a win because then you work because you want to work and you do what you want to because you want to, not because you have to. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big... So th- where's the downside for being a disciplined person that saves 20 and invests 20 to 25%? I just don't see it because I think when you can own your time sooner and have even more flexibility and margin, it, it really opens up some doors That um, versus the other side is just build your lifestyle, consume more, and then be unpleasantly surprised when you realize, holy cow, maybe maybe I should have been saving more money because I'm, I was successful and I was acting rich versus building wealth. That's great. Awesome. Frank, thank you for your question. Thanks for being here. Really glad we got to answer it today. Hey, Reeves, you ready? More tangents than the geometry book today. We just got a comment here. It said, love your shirt. Chop on. What do you want yeah. to say to that? We actually had a couple comments on your shirt. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I went, on spring tra- I went to spring training last week mm-hmm. with my childhood friends. It, it is, and I've been telling everybody this, there is something unique when you've known people since you were five years old. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is just no falsities in the relationships. It's um, No matter where life takes you, you're still those same five-year-old I mean, we kids, still right? remember, you know, cr- I have crazy stories on it, and they all know the dirt on me. So it's <laughs> um, so it's mutual destruction, if, if I, so I won't say anything against them. But it's... Um, but it, it, it's just, it was fun. And I love it because we're, we're old, old enough. I even told a story. We went to a great Italian restaurant in Sarasota. And then we're so old that the, that we walked home. Because you needed to walk it off. We need to right? walk it off. I mean, I, I don't think, I think, you know, we're just, it's just different when you're older. But it's, um, but we had a great time. It was a blast. And yeah, we got to see the Braves. Got to see, uh, we're, we're. I'm a Braves fan because I grew up in a Braves fan. My dad would watch the Braves because we got uh, the, through the antenna. We got TBS, and um, so I know. Here's what's crazy: I could tell you the lineups pretty much from the '70s, '80s, '90s. I know all those lineups, uh-huh. and I could talk about those players. If you ask me about players now, I can tell you because I just went to spring training, so I know a lot more. But it, but my friends, my childhood friends, are legitimate baseball fans and it was fun being around people who were so passionate about about, know all the players and um so we saw that we went to several stadiums saw the orioles um we we even drove to fight the weather we went up to toronto's stadium down in florida and then we also of course went to to braves uh, to watch them play as well it was good i am glad you had a good time that's great and by the way these shirts are like the masters tournament it's a complete ripoff. Oh, I was about no. to say, but you, but you love it. You're wear like, what, yeah. If you want the palm tree <laughs> with the Atlanta Braves symbol, you pay it you because pay you're there. Mm-hmm. So you pay for the the memory, even though you just you hold your nose and know you're getting ripped off. And Brian did it because memories blossom. What do you say? Yeah. Well, yeah. Something well, I, like I, that. I, just, I know. Here's what, here's the way I feel guilty. In the past, I've always tight wadded it out, and I just I buy a hat. And then not only do I buy a hat. Here's a little. If you if you go to the Braves do you stadium. Wear hats? No, I don't wear hats that much, but but it's the cheapest thing. So I'd go downstairs, and they have a clearance section in Braves Stadium spring training. You go straight down. Matter of fact, when I got there, this I was like, hey, y'all still have that clearance section downstairs? He goes, man, you've been here before. And I was like, yeah. So I went straight down, and I asked the guy who was working the clearance section. I was like, where are your clearance hats? And he goes, oh, man, you know we're at the end of spring training, so everything's sold out now. So I was like, okay, you know, every year I buy a hat. I don't wear hats that much because why would you cover up this hair? If you have enough. this type of hair, you don't wear hats. And um, so I, I bought a shirt. I love it. I'm glad you did. You've earned it. So it looks good. So Love look. to see it. Have fun, with that one. have fun with that one, Nate. 
<laughs> that's not gonna be a highlight. No, oh. that's something that gets thrown away. You just get that benefit Nate, that for not watching a the live stream. Just saying that officially here for the record. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, we do have more questions. The next one is for Helicopterodactyl. What is that? That's a username. A mix of a helicopter and a pterodactyl. Mm -hmm. So the question says, okay. we have been, we're married, we're in our 30s, we're on step eight of the foo, and we have Woo. a 33.3% savings rate. Woo. Very exact. And we are about to take a vacation for more Woo. than 50% of my first job's annual salary. Yeah. When did Brian and Bo first think, you know, I've made it? Mm. What do you think about this? Because obviously I, he, I, he sounds pretty uh, floored at the amount of money that he's just spending, but it also mm. sounds like he's earned it. So do you have any thoughts on this mindset shift and reaching this phase of, you know, actually getting to the payoff part of wealth building? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I think we all um, we all can remember early on in our careers or, or just starting out and, or, and maybe some of you are still there. You're in that place right now. And you just think about the things like, oh man, you know what? I really want guacamole on my burrito, but it's not worth two fifty eight, dollars right? You know, like I just, ah, I'm just not going to do that thing. And then life continues to move and then lifestyle, <clears throat> lifestyle creep happens, but not necessarily in the bad way. Cause we, 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 hold the position that there is negative lifestyle creep and then there is positive lifestyle creep. And lifestyle creep in and of itself is not a bad thing. So when I hear helicopter adactyl say, man, we're about to go on a vacation and I'm going to spend 50% of what I made my first year in the workforce, I think that sounds awesome. I, I, don't, I don't think that sounds horrible at all because you told me I'm on step eight. I've been following the financial order of operations. I'm saving 33.3% of my gross income and I'm in my thirties. So that means I've been doing this for a while. So now I'm beginning to see my army of dollar bills grow. Perhaps I've reached that boiling point. Perhaps my portfolio is now at the escape velocity standpoint where it's okay for me to increase my lifestyle to some extent. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. No, but I, I wanted to put a few things in here is, um, Debbie Downer. Right I, no, 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 not at all. But I, I think it's like most things with success is additional accountability and, and, and sometimes even more work. Sure. Um, so and I, I put down the first thing I wrote was do the work, meaning that I love that. And I'm not adding on the, the pterodactyl part. I'm just saying calling him helicopter. Um, but helicopter, do the work. Because I truthfully, y'all heard I don't speak English yeah, that well. Yeah, so we, I think, I think, I'll, I think I'd blow you're good, it up. You're good. You're good. But, do the know your number course, or at least do the that's research great. to see, because here's the only cold water I have on this, because everything that you laid out, that's why I was whooping it up, is that you, you're you crushing it. But you are 30 years old, it's still young enough that I don't know how long you've been saving at this high savings rate, that you still could be really close to the, to, to the starting line versus building up the critical mass of getting to your first six figures, to getting to closer to a million dollars. There's... A, there is a process. So I don't know how close to the starting line you are. So do the work, know your number. But then once you do that and you find out, yeah, I am way ahead of the curve. And based upon everything you laid out being at step eight, 33% savings rate, um, you, you, you're doing great. Then be per purposeful on how you spend your time mm -hmm. and what you use, you, you know, how you create blossoming memories. And I'm okay. If you've done the homework and you've done, put in the hard work of knowing your number and knowing where you are from an analytical standpoint, Go out there and have a, a great vacation. I mean, this is it is one of those things where I remember when I now I'll, I'll be honest and transparent. I didn't get to do some of these things you're talking about. Not at 30. It was more like mid 40s. It mm -hmm. was 42 to, to 45 is when I actually started feeling like I had reached a level of comfort. Um, but I, I used that when I hit that point to be very sentimental about it, to be purposeful, to be thankful, to to make sure that I was paying it forward, but also not letting moments escape me um, where I was very sentimental to what this meant for, for me, my family. So I think if you come at it from those healthy perspectives, you're going to be in a great place and um, keep crushing it. And I'll, I'll keep whooping it up for you. Uh, let me ask you a question, Brian, because the, the very tail end of this question said, you know, when did Brian and Bo first think I've made it? I know for me personally, I try to, and I don't, I don't think it's going to sound bad. I try to purposely fight the thought of, oh, okay, I've made it. Oh, okay, I've made it. I mean, I, 
objectively, certainly there are some metrics that you can measure where things end up in a really good spot. But even now, even at this stage of my life, I still try to implement for scarcity. I still try to think about, okay, if, you know, if whatever's happening in my life, how can I make sure that things don't feel so comfortable so that I know I'm continuing to do the things that I'm supposed to be doing, that I'm continuing to build. And so I try, at least at this stage, to not say, oh, I've made it, oh, I've made it, because I think there is value in having a goal or having something that you are continuing to work for rather than feeling so comfortable, unless you truly are at the financial independence point and financial independence for you means something like living off of my assets and, and not having to work anymore, not having to create income anymore. Anything that you would add to that? I mean, this is probably not directly on point with what, I'll, I'll try it, helicopter, Adactyl. dactyl um, was, was asking, but I have found that um, it, it's one of those things where I used to, I think all achievers, anybody who's just hard driven to be successful, you set goal points for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I, I remember I read that book, and I'm going to mess this up. Maybe you can, because I know we talked about it. The Simon Sinek book on Eternal Game or? Uh, the Eternity the, Game. The Eternity right? Game or something like that. But, cause, and, and there was a good point in the book and the fact that a lot of us successful people, we set goals. And I see this when people do it on finances is that, man, if I could just get to $3 million, I would get to $5 million. I don't care. Ten to, whatever your number is. That is going to have an end point that's going to probably feel more empty than you the realize. Infinite game. Infinite game. There it is. Um, what I have recognized for myself is is that as I've had more successes, and this is kind of getting into that abundance level on the five levels of wealth, is I wanted to know who I was, what I valued, and kind of what gave me purpose. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was it went beyond the finances, and now it's what can we build, who can we impact, and am I making the world a little bit better place? Mm -hmm. So I've quit putting goal points where which financial are in, goal in, financially points. goal points that because I think I've already reached the financial independence stage, but I've I, I've now tried to think about it more of where I want to be and what is a a, a life well lived, mm -hmm. and that's why we've had conversations like, you know, not selling the company and other mm -hmm. things because I just I'm very deliberate on what I think the impact we're doing and what and who it's reaching. And I think that's just a different, that's why it kind of leans into and touches on that be sentimental and be deliberate with um, why you're here on the planet and do and, and be the best version of that. Love it. Helicopter Adactyl, thanks for your question. Glad we got to answer it today. Next question is from Daniel. It says, I have the option to buy title insurance for myself for my new home. I am required to purchase it from my lender. Is it, it is about $1,100 for the title insurance. I heard that it's a scam and pays out at a much lower rate than any other type of insurance. Do I still need title insurance? Um, this is a great question. And um, this is one forever. I kind of, I just piggybacked on somebody I look up to. I was about to say, oh, that's exactly but, but no, what I was but, I, but I want to tell you, I've, I've bought a few houses now, so I've got a little more of experience on, on where you can, squeeze on this a little mm -hmm. bit is that Clark Howard, we all know Clark Howard fingerprints you, all over goat. me, anybody from Atlanta or even, I know he's, you know, Clark all touches, the, he's all, all the over the place, but, but I, I love me some Clark Howard and Clark forever would be like, buy that title insurance. Now here's what I recognize once I started buying houses is that if you're doing a mortgage, your lender is already going to require mm -hmm. that, that a title search and, and buying insurance is already part of the process. What your goal should now be, and you can do some research on this, is keeping them honest that they're not double dipping, charging both of you the same cost. You, you want to kind of find out and do a little research and even squeeze them on. Since they're already having to do the title insurance mm -hmm. for your um, mortgage company, can they get a little more competitive with that piggyback policy essentially that's already going off the heavy lift that you're having to pay for for the mortgage company and give you that that policy at a much cheaper price mm -hmm. squeeze them on that ask and negotiate but yes i like title insurance just for the peace of mind especially if you've got a mortgage they're already doing the work anyway see if you can get it for a, a very reasonable add-on fee and and then you're protected yes but hopefully you'll never need to claim it but it, you're at least covered on a very expensive asset yeah I, th I think that people don't often recognize how much of the 
home closing process is negotiable. A, a, a lot, of, even a lot of first time home buyers, they just think, okay, well, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I show up and all right, show me where to sign and where do I send the check. You can advocate for yourself, and you know they do the thing. Uh, and I feel like it's almost up to fail, but you go in for the closing, and I think you told me you were one of the people who at your very first home closing, you sat there and like read every, well, they, they, I think mm-hmm. they tried to discourage you from doing that, from like reading all the stuff. Make sure you educate yourself. You ought to say, okay, well, what, if I go out, Daniel, and I buy this title insurance policy, what's it protecting me from? What's the risk that I could run into where I would have to utilize this policy? And is that something that actually gives me apprehension? Okay, if the answer is yes, it gives me apprehension. Is it worth $1,100 to me? Or is it worth some dollar value less than that? Because it's going to come down to a little bit of your own risk tolerance, risk capacity standpoint, and you have to navigate it that way. But I think the more that you can educate yourself on the closing process, the more well-prepared that you will be to go into that. And I do think this is even one of the things that, you know, as I know there's some stuff out there about it now. Really good real estate agents can help you with some of this stuff. If they've gone through a lot of this, they can be advocates to educate you on exactly what you are signing off on and how that app, uh, how that operates in the closing process. Let me give a few additional tips to kind of tie into this title insurance question is that, because and this is, by the way, from my own, what I've learned. I've, I think I'm five houses now between, mm-hmm. you know, investments. And, that, and then if you did closings on commercial property, I'm probably getting close to, to double digit mm-hmm. closings for personal stuff. And then I've reviewed a bunch for clients. Here's Here's some things you should know. I showed up to my first closing with a checkbook. I didn't know anything about it. My wife and I, and I realized we were 24, 25 uh-huh. years old when we bought this first house. I showed up and they're like, what? They're like, no, you have to wire the money. <laughs> you, che- you have to wire doing, the son? money. And I was like, no, I thought I was going to just write a check. And they're, I, I'm surprised they even let me get into the closing. <laughs> but we somehow worked our, our way through it. But but here's so here's some things that I have done being a person who's had a little more experience buying houses. You don't go to closing unless they have, and you put them on notice that you need to see all the settlement statements mm-hmm. and you want to see how the money is going to flow out a few days before closing. You're not wired because you, you, they'll tell you a lot of, t- I, th- I think a lot of times with title companies, they just give you the amount you owe and then they expect you just to wire it. Now, I want to see That's how right. they broke it out. I want to make sure. And even before that, I'm negotiating on the title insurance and other things. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing wrong with you advocating for yourself to want to see all the numbers, make sure you agree with everything, and make sure you're on the same page. And then once you agree on everything, you, you be very careful with the wiring process. You mm-hmm. will wire the money, but criminals have gotten very good because it's not uncommon with data breaches, especially with uh, real estate attorneys, is that they can get in and then be in an, an email account and then find out who closing, you know, closing things and then send a bogus email with false wiring instructions. Mm-hmm. So that's why even if they email you wiring instructions and the letterhead looks good, I would cu- go on the Google, I called it like an old the man. Google. I'd go on the go internet, on the go on the internet, look up the title company from um, from the internet, you know, directly Google search it or however you, you find it. Go Call the, the number Google. that's on the internet. Then talk to, you know, the person, verify the wiring instructions, then wire the money to make mm-hmm. sure you're in a good place. Um, and, and I think those are just some of the tips that I would do. Don't show up with a checkbook. You're going to wire the money, but you will need to be very cautious about wiring because a lot of times you're on the hook if you send it to a criminal. Um, and then just make sure that you, you see the settlement statement so that you know where the money's going. Congratulations on closing your first home. That's no small feat in this real estate environment. Absolutely. And, and by the way, the, the settlement settlement statement lets you not annoy the attorney by reading every... You still go, go through the forms sure. and let them explain, but you're not going to sit there and go, what do you mean this costs this much? <laughs> you will have already had it in your privacy of your own home. You'll be able to have those conversations with yourself. Good advice. All right, we're going to move on to Tyler H.'s question. It says, is there an advantage to a Roth IRA versus a Roth 401k? I hear lots about the IRA as a great tool and not so much about the 401k besides the match. Am I missing some advantage of the IRA? Well, let's go through some pros and cons, right? So you have Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks, and you're specifically asking, what are the advantages to the Roth IRA over the 401k? So I'll speak to that, and then you can talk about why the 401ks are awesome. 
Uh, so not all 401ks are created equal. Some of them might have uh, a poor array of investment options. They might be uh, heavy laden with like insurance type products, really expensive underlying investments. And so when you look at that, you may determine that, man, this 401k, even if I did Roth, is kind of expensive. With a Roth IRA, I get to choose my provider. I can go look at a Fidelity or a Vanguard or a Charles Schwab or a fill in the blank, and I get to choose the investment options in there. If I want to go buy a super low cost index fund or target retirement index fund, I can do that. So Roth IRA, I get to make all the choices around that. So there's a really good chance that it's going to be less expensive because of that. Additionally, Roth IRAs don't have a third party administrator or a record keeper that are having to charge to administer the plan. With a 401k, those costs are there. Now, with a lot of companies, the or with a lot of 401ks, the company might cover the cost of those plans. But again, with a Roth IRA, you get to pick and choose, so the costs are likely going to be less. And then this is the third advantage I would throw out there. When you leave a company behind or when you change jobs, if your Roth IRA is at Fidelity or at Charles Schwab, it can just stay there as is. You don't have to go through HR. You don't have to communicate with anyone else. You can let it just sit there and stay the way it is. With a Roth 401k, there's a chance that you're going to have to continue to maintain a relationship with your prior employer or with the prior provider so that you can get information on your account. So I would argue with a Roth IRA, the ball stays a little bit firmer in your court around the decision making and communication. What would you say the advantages, Brian, to Roth or to the 401k side are? Yeah, well, 401k, look, it used to also be, just from a historical context, Roth IRAs in the past didn't have required minimum distributions, whereas your Roth 401k did. However, they fixed that little mm -hmm. quirk. So that's good. So the pros for an employer plan is you can put more money because yep. the annual contributions are substantially higher with your 401ks, your 403bs, and they are with the Roth IRAs. I mean, I'm talking about, was it 22500 now versus... That was last year's. This year's 23000 Man, why am I having a hard time switching into 2020? So 23000 you know versus... Do you know why? It's because you're catch-up eligible. You don't care about those numbers anymore. Now that you got that catch-up... 23000 versus, and I'm not even going to try to, to embarrass myself, what's the 401... I mean, the IRA contribution? Uh, $7,000 So see, year. you can see there's a substantial difference. There's $16,000 difference between those two. Also, 401 one case have what's called ERISA protection, mm -hmm. meaning that if you got into a lawsuit, creditors, or anything like that, your 401k likely would have more protection than than the IRA would. I'll just uh, the the cons. Bo already kind of set them with the 401k as the investment choice. You, now, there's a good chance if you work for like a big corporation, um, it, you might not have a negative thing because mm -hmm. if they're already working with great. like the Fidelities, the Vanguards, or the Schwabs. And you have a low cost, you get all the protections, and then your employer's covering all the costs. That's that's a solid thing, but that's not for, for a lot of the small plans. And then there is that awkwardness as if you leave um, your, 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 your employer, you probably are going to have to reach out to somebody in HR or whoever does payroll or bookkeeping for, for your former employer to get access to the rollover paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, or you have to worry, as my account over... You know, was it five thousand dollars or whatever? Or it they, depends on how either one thousand or five thousand. Yeah, they can, but they, you don't want to be forced into a distribution. If it gets big enough, they can't do that to you. But still, you have to deal with an old employer, mm -hmm. um, which has some complications sometimes if you don't leave on on best of terms. Only two things I'd add to that: uh, with the four hundred one k, no income limit. Roth IRAs, oh, if true. you make that's over great. a certain income, you can't contribute to a Roth with a four hundred one k. That's not the case, and. With a 401k, there's a match, right? So don't ever forego your match in order to do a Roth IRA because matching money in 401ks is so, 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 so valuable. What's funny is that I can see over here, Bo has a sticky note with four things on it. I see check marks next to two of them. <laughs> I failed on those I other two. Just, so, no, so there you no, go. Just, just different strokes. That's all. Playing horseshoes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure we give nice, good, thorough uh, answers. That's I all. Love it. You got two of them. Now he's going to do I the other two. I had to take notes while you were talking. That's right. Fantastic. All right. Well, Tyler H., thank you so much for that question. We're going to move on to a question from Homegrown Hillary. It says, can you explain the difference between a spousal IRA and a SEP IRA for a stay-at-home parent who has a side hustle? Okay. Uh, a, sp a spousal IRA si simply is an another way of saying a traditional IRA for the spouse, right? So we have 
Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs. Roth are tax-free. Traditional IRAs, if you satisfy certain requirements, can be tax deductible. So those are both limited to like $7,000 a year uh, in this year if you're under age 50. So uh, one of the things that's great about spousal IRAs is that uh, if you are a working spouse and one spouse stays home, you guys can both contribute to your IRAs even if the stay-at-home spouse does not have any earned income. That's then called a spousal IRA. They can make a contribution based on the household earnings record of their spouse. That's different than, in this situation, homegrown Hillary says, hey, uh, I, what's different than a spousal IRA versus a spouse who has a side income that might be able to do a SEP IRA? Well, when the spouse has an income, that changes it. Now they have a SEP IRA availability. Yeah, a, a SEP IRA. By the way, if you have a side hustle, side income, that that's considered earned income. Mm -hmm. uh, it's self-employment income. It's going to be subject to Medicare, Social Security. By the way, if you're wondering what's earned income, anything that's subject to Social Security, Medicare, or self-employment taxes is kind of what's on that, that threshold. SEP IRA is going to be um, funded at 20 to 25% of whatever, depending on how it's structured, because mm -hmm. you have a... a self-employment tax adjustment on there. That's why I give you a range on that. But it's um it's going to be off of how much you made on the side hustle. The spousal IRA has zero earned income as long as your spouse has earned income. I mean, it lets you essentially use a portion of your 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 working spouse's um, earned income to to apply for your own benefits. So that that's the big difference is I would tell you if you're actually doing a SEP IRA and a side hustle and you have a good amount of money coming in because remember i said that the profit sharing from a sep ira is only 20 25 you actually might be able to do both it's mm -hmm. just but you wouldn't do a spousal ira you just go do a set up a roth ira or a traditional ira or plus a sep ira you can you can do both of these um without concern yeah one one of the things that i would encourage you to think about because we've, we've seen this happen a few times is make sure you do the math on which one is actually more advantageous we've seen it happen before where a spouse will have some sort of side income, and let's say maybe it's two, three thousand dollars of side income, and they immediately think, "Hey, I'm going to do a set because I can do that based on that earned income." Well, if you happen to fall into the place to where you can deduct your traditional IRA contributions, it would be more advantageous for you to take a seven thousand dollar traditional deduction then make a 20 to 25% contribution on two or $3,000 of side income. So make sure you understand which one of those is actually the most advantageous for you. I think as you get into higher side hustle incomes, the SEP or the solo 401k, you're going to be the ones. But at those lower amounts, it's worth measuring twice, cutting once on that. You could do the SEP, you know, take the tax deduction, and then do the Roth IRA yeah, and, yep. and get the tax-free growth. I mean, Love it. there's all kind of opportunities here with, with for homegrown Hillary. And by the way, I don't know why when I see it here, homegrown Hillary, I think of clogging. I don't know why. It just but that name. It just it sounds like it's, it made me feel. And maybe it's because I, I, I mean, that's just where I grew up with. I just didn't expect that. Uh, if you were I was me thinking of ten thousand guesses know, to gardening. guess what came to your mind. Clogging was not going to be on there. <laughs> maybe it's because when I was at spring training last week, you know, were there, it, it, there? there was some clogging on that's one of the dugouts. Was. That's what it was. He, so. It was that's it and, and it made me think of because I, I mean it's not uncommon. By the way, if you come up here on Saturdays, uh -huh. have you been up here on Saturdays? Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of cloggers uh -huh. that come out here on the Franklin Square mm. and are always because when I come up here and work every now and then, and bring my daughter. She loves just looking out just the window, watch them. watching them awesome. clog on, on the square. That's amazing. I mean, hey, maybe Hillary does clogging. I don't know. I don't know cool. why homegrown I mean, nothing, Hillary nothing sounds like that. it's a clogger. I was really surprised. That is what, not if what I, I was a clogger, of. that would be my name. What kind of plot twist would it be if the side income was for like for a clogging, clogging gigs like performance? That yeah, that would be great. Also, the, the hotel I stayed at for spring training, they were hosting a ballroom dancing competition. Did you did you enter? No, in? we didn't get it. We were there for spring training, but I thought it was fascinating because as we were you walking by the car, you could see in the convention centers attached. They had all these rows of like these fancy dresses that they were like vendors and and other things for ballroom dancing. That's like selling dresses, like or I, like. I, I guess I don't know. We didn't go in. That's wild. I mean, but it was a lot of sparkly stuff all set up. So, sounds well, fantastic. Sounds awesome. Okay, we're gonna move on to Ben's question next. It says, we've been investing in our HSA and keeping receipts for many years. Mm. 
Would it make sense to keep maxing our HSA contributions, but start cashing in old receipts to allow us to contribute more to our Roth accounts? You always talk about triple tax advantage in HSA, so I'm curious to hear what you say. <sighs> okay, let me think through this. We've been contributing to our HSA, mm -hmm. and we're saving a lot of receipts. So we yes. have about a lot of like built up expenses. By the way, for those of you that don't know, uh, if you're one of the 4% of the populations doing this, you do know it. If you're one of the 96% that do not do this, listen up. With health savings accounts, you can put money in, get a, con get a deduction on the front end. You can invest those dollars. They can grow tax deferred. And then if you use it for future medical expenses or prior medical expenses that you incurred while covered by a high deductible plan, all those distributions are completely tax-free. Only 4% of folks do that. We would encourage you to be one of those 4% if you can. So Ben says, all right, I'm putting money in the HSA. I'm saving the receipts. Would it be advantageous for me to begin cashing in some of those receipts so that I could put money into the Roth? Well, that, that's, the only, that's the only thing. Because, look, both of those, if I hold up the financial order operations, you can go to moneyguy.com slash resources. You, you can download your own. Both of those are step five. And the reason they're step five is because they're tax-free growth mm -hmm, opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but I, I give Ben credit because it's like you said, we always talk about HSAs. The reason they're right there with Roth IRAs is the triple tax advantage. Mm -hmm. If you're just using an HSA, a health savings account, as a clearing account, you're only taking advantage of the deduction on the front end. You're not taking advantage. That's only one. That's not triple. Mm -hmm. That's one mm -hmm. tax advantage. Um, I like that Ben's doing both. But here's the dilemma is that, and, th and this is something, because I love Roth IRAs. I, I want him to be funding that too. But I also know that first 10 years that you invest, it, it, most of the contribution, especially like first five years, if you look back, you'll see like, man, my account value is probably 80% my contributions mm -hmm. versus the fair market value. Right. 10 years in the future, it might be, man, now my contributions are only, and I'm making these numbers off of, but we've done research on this in the past, off of like 50% mm -hmm. of the account value. But then if you go out 20 and 30 years in the future, you're like, holy cow, now my, you know, 70 to 80% of the account value is actually all growth. So that's why you're in a dilemma that, you know, you, you, you how do you maximize the timing? But then I bring it back to the point of, but, but I really like Roth IRAs, too. Yeah. He's getting the tax deduction, do the Roth. So I think you create a system that you kind of, that reflects, because I don't like you not doing a Roth IRA also. Well, I think that in my mind, as I'm thinking through this, I think they're the same. I think that they're equivalent while the dollars are sitting in there. If you have receipts to justify, that money is the same, whether it's sitting in a Roth or whether it is sitting in HSA. As long as you have medical expenses that offset. That's right. Now, the earnings are what change. And this is the only this is the only thing that I'm thinking through academically, be why it might yeah, make be sense. Because the HSA is going to have a limit on the tax-free, meaning you have to have expenses. You have to have expenses. Whereas the Roth does not. True, but I'm going to argue that right, it's healthcare. We're all, we're going to use we're all going to have enough money on healthcare as we get older to be able to burn that money. This is where I th this is one place I think that the the change is. Uh, if you pass away with HSA dollars, uh, I believe there's been legislation that came out that says that the decedent, so long as you have medical records, you can then distribute tax free to the estate the HSA dollars to reimburse for medical expenses. With a Roth IRA, if someone were to inherit the Roth IRA, not only did that money grow tax-free for their life, it can grow tax-free for the uh, 10 years of the beneficiary's lives. So I think from an estate planning standpoint, the Roth might be slightly more advantageous than an HSA, right? From Yes. I mean, after you take advantage of the deduction on the HSA, then you still want to make sure you get the Roth get IRA the Roth. in. Yep. So I'd, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, but it goes back to Ben's question. When should he cash in I know. some of those existing? So here's what I would say, Ben. If you have to do it to the Roth, then let's go ahead and start doing it. But if you can actually fund the, the take the deduction, and then the deduction now allows you to do the Roth, do as little of cashing in as possible, but try to get the Roth IRA. I think that's the answer. You just said do both. No, I, I, I said fund the HSA, but then sell enough to where he can then fund his Roth IRA, but not a not an ounce more, so that he can continue to let that four percent double and triple um, tax advantage work in the HSA. Okay, 
Cool. Man, we made that about as clear as. <laughs> I think they're pretty. a milkshake. Well, that helps. Out. It, it's a hard. Give it's some. A, it, we yeah, I don't know if there's one them. perfect hard. answer there. It's really yeah. hard. Well, it's nuanced. So I would I would love to see. This is the problem. I, I hate it when in financial planning I say they people ask me a question. I say, well, it depends. Mm-hmm. And then and depend. then I need it to see your depend. data to give you the exact personalized information for your situation. So I'm trying to give an answer that even though I don't know all of Ben's things that that works, mm-hmm. and, and and that's hard. Well, Ben, we appreciate the question, and we do hope that kind of helped you think through some different nuances of your question. So thanks for being here. Uh, Natasha's question is up next. It says, my fiance and I want to buy a home. I've been saving for a down payment for almost two years, but he has a lot of his money in retirement accounts. Should he pull any money out of those retirement accounts so that they can buy this home? I think that this is both a logistical question and it's a relational question, uh-huh. and I'm very interested to see how you answer do, do this. You, do you know what I find interesting? By the way, Natasha, the first thing, and we this goes back to we had another relationship question. Communication is a key component here because it sounds like for the last few years, the last two years for sure, y'all had two separate things rolling here. Uh-huh. You, you've said at some point you made the determination that, you know, what's important to me is we ought to buy a house. So I'm going to start saving for a down payment. But your your spouse, I don't know if y'all didn't have that conversation or if y'all just doing things completely independent. Like, let's load up the cash. I'm I'm loading up the retirement. And that's fine if your cash savings are enough. But if you're both in on this, you got yourself in a little bit of a pickle because, yes, there's there are some sl- small loopholes, which because I don't even off the top of what was it ten thousand dollars you can do for a first time home purchase so, out of a you know out of a, something like that. You could that, do yeah. loans, but I, I hate taking money from retirement mm-hmm. accounts because it just works against what the whole purpose of those assets are for. But there are some things that maybe can get this back to the the, the middle for you guys. But the first thing. You got to start making sure y'all are on the same page about financial objectives and goals, um, because that that's just that, that's a problem when they when they're going in two and different guys, directions. And guys, neither of those are bad goals. No, that's the not thing at too. All. Like, I don't know, maybe you're gonna come together and find a way to like take advantage of the things that you've done. Mm-hmm. I agree. It does sound like they're saving it, to two different things. It, and it's interesting. This is what I don't know. Uh, it says my fiance and I want to buy. Oh, a fiance. Home. Okay. So we don't know how we don't yeah, know how this, long. That's you, true. You guys Good have point. been engaged, so maybe right. y'all maybe y'all have not been on different pages y'all just came together and now you're wanting to buy a home together but you know as you get married and that kind of stuff which which is great uh so let's let's remove the relational emotional part from the equation is it a good idea to draw money out of retirement accounts for a down payment i'm going to argue man if you can avoid doing that i think that your future self would likely thank you so what i would encourage you guys to think about is okay. What is the down payment we need to we need to save up for? And by the way, if, if if you're thinking about buying this first house, go to moneyguide.com/resources. We have tons of home buying tools out there. We have calculators, we have checklists, we have all kinds of articles that we've written to help you make sure you're making this decision really, really well. Because one of the unique things that is unique, I think, to our perspective, is when it comes to that down payment. Rather than having to come up with a 20% down payment, so long as you can make sure that your total housing cost does not exceed 25% of your gross income, you only have to come up with 3 to 5% for that down payment. So I would figure out, okay, based on what we both have readily available in after-tax non-retirement assets, how far away are we from that down payment? And how long would we have to continue on our current trajectory to get there without pulling out of our retirement to do that. Because I just think that you're gonna find when you start using retirement assets to begin funding those types of goals, even though they're like admirable, wonderful goals of home ownership, that money becomes really, really expensive, especially if you're doing premature distributions, especially if you're having to pay penalties and ordinary income tax rates on those, it just becomes so expensive. So I'd love to see the two of you put together a plan that allows you to accomplish that without having to go into the retirement coffers to do so. Yeah, and lean on the home buying checklist. And then if this is y'all's first house, that three to five percent down payment, it should provide a lot of grace. And then start having good conversations. Cause Bo makes a great point. I didn't I, I didn't catch on to the they fiance just got engaged part. In December. Yeah. So I mean this is I, I Congratulations. Commun- great point now to start having great communication. Take advantage of the three to five percent and then y'all figure out how you can um, work those goals out together. Love it.
Rib, was that good? We give enough we give enough meat on that one? Yeah, I think you did. Okay. I think I think you're exactly right. You gave the non emotional, like, hey, I don't know if retirement account is the place you want to draw money from, but um yeah, you gave a lot of good advice. I liked it. Awesome. If Ruby signs off on it, we're good. <laughs> Natasha, I hope that helped. Uh, and honestly, congratulations, because it sounds like this is pretty recent. Uh-huh. So it's great that you're asking these questions and that you're wanting to get on the same page and have these financial goals. So I think that that's fantastic. And we're glad that you're here. And hopefully um, we're going to help you consider those things as you watch the Money Guy show. <laughs> okay. Andrew's question is up next. Was that Andrew or Andrea? Andrew. Andrew. Don't be picking on Reby. I was no, no, say, I, I thought I, I said it pretty no, no, clearly, no, but hey. Here. That was on me. That's me. I'm very sensitive to how people pronounce things now. <laughs> <laughs> I was genuinely not picking on you, Reby. Thank you. Appreciate that. I think I'm just hypersensitive now. Okay, well, Andrew asks, My employer gives us an annual bonus, which can be taken as cash, leveraged stock options, or a mixture of both. How do I think about which option to take? Wait a minute. Let me get this right. Annual bonus. Leverage stock options. What was the other two options? Cash, Cash. or a mixture of both. Oh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm and um, bonus ranges from 5 to 10% is the last piece of information. So how should he think about which option to take? Uh, okay. I want to I want to be clear here. Um, I, I, I don't know. I want to make the word leverage here threw me off. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and ask Andrew. I bet there's not like leverage stock options. I bet your bonus you're able to choose, do I either take stock options or cash? That that's a more common thing that we see the lever thing kind of kind of threw it off on me. And so the <laughs> that cuz that's what threw you Could off you too, imagine? right? It sounds like a casino almost. It's like, "Hey, we're going to let you I'm borrow give you cash yeah. or we'll go with the leverage, <laughs> you know, leverage um, stock options." I, I I think I think it's either stock options or cash, which is not uncommon a lot of times, especially when you work for publicly traded entities. They will give you an option on how you receive your bonus. You can either receive it in employer stock, in this case, options to buy the stock at some future date, or cash. So how do I go about deciding which one of these makes sense? And Brian, you and I have a ton of experience. We've worked with a lot of people over the last, what, 20 years or so, who've had options available through their employer, whether they be part of their compensation or part of the way they elect to receive bonuses. And options can be wonderful because what an option does is it gives you the opportunity to buy a stock at a given price at some point in the future. So you get an option. I want to buy my company stock for $10 per share and I get to decide when I want to do that. Well, it's kind of a no brainer if the stock price goes up to $100 per share, but you have an option that allows you to buy it for $10 a share, that option is pretty stinking valuable. So it allows you to participate in the growth of the company, so it can be a very attractive thing. Cash, on the other hand, is exactly what it is. You get cash today, and it's worth exactly what the cash is. So how does Andrew go about deciding, how do I do this? Is it better to take stock, or is it better to take the cash? Yeah, this is, um, I always say we need a little bit more data, because I was, even it could be a stock purchase plan, it could be stock options, it could be restricted stock units. We see all kind of versions, and, and then those there's usually some type of incentive when you take the stock stock as well. Think about like an employee stock purchase plan. They usually have a discount, either 15% off the beginning of the quarter or whatever the, the whatever the lowest price is, either the mm-hmm. beginning of the quarter, end of the quarter. So that's almost like a guaranteed 15% um, payment there. Restricted stock units, they usually, you know, you're, you're dealing with some stated, you know, you, you work here long enough, we're going to give you these, they're going to vest mm-hmm. over time. There's an incentive to keep you there. So I need a little bit more data on, on how this is structured. But I will say this, assuming there is some incentive that they're going to give you on um, the options, RSUs, or the employee stock purchase plan, make sure that your human capital and your investment capital stay somewhat separated. I want you to take advantage of the incentives that you're, especially if they're they're kind of really giving you some type of incentive to do the stock. Um, I would I would encourage you to do that, but just make sure that you try to keep it below 10% of your total investable assets. And that's why you'll probably want to create some type of timeline of action because there's just a risk of having your human capital, meaning the hours you trade of your time 
for uh, to go towards labor and wages to create income for your family. You don't want that tied into your financial assets completely because then you you literally have the all your eggs in one basket. If it goes down, it destroys your entire financial life. So that's why it's nice to kind of diversify those things. Now, look, concentration can create tremendous wealth, um, whereas usually when you get wealth, you want to diversify. But it is one of those things where you have to be careful. And a lot of times as an insider or working for a company, you get caught up in all the excitement and it might blind you to the risk. So just don't get caught up in all that. Make sure there's a balance there on your wealth building journey of, of creating you know, diversification, financial assets that are working just as hard as you do with your back, your brain, and your hands. Love it. Fantastic. One other consideration. Sorry. Yes. One other consideration. Yeah, put it in there. Uh, one of the benefits of options when you're thinking through this is that with options, you get to choose the taxability event. You get to choose when the tax event takes place. So one of the things that may be going on with your employer is they're giving you, if you receive the cash bonus right now, it's going to be immediately taxable to you this year. If you were to receive the options, there's a good chance that the taxability will be deferred until some point in the future right, when point. you exercise those options. So there's also this like higher level of thinking you need to enter into to say, okay, it is there likely over the next 10 years, because most options have a 10 year expiration window, is there a chance that when I want to receive the value of these options, I'm going to be in a different tax environment that will have been more advantageous for me to choose to trigger that taxable event? And then coupled with that, what do I really think the trajectory of the employer stock is going to look like? Are we like a new exciting technology? Is there something going on there? Is it a blue chip stock or is it something super aggressive that could likely fall out of the money based on where my exercise price is? So there's there's a lot that has to go into this. And I would even contend the choice that you make may change year over year based on your personal circumstances and based on your company's personal circumstances. So this should be one that every open enrollment, as you're making this election, you're really thinking through the best way to tackle it. And we, we didn't even talk about deferred comp. We didn't talk about top hat programs. These are things, like I tell you guys all the time, the more successful you get, the more complexity will come your way that's why when everybody says, why would you ever need a financial advisor? Just go buy the S&P 500. Ask yourself, do you know what to do with all the, that's what these are the, this is why you don't need a financial advisor if you're just buying index funds and you don't have complexity. But I'm telling you, the more successful you get, this stuff just tracks you down. And that's why we're, we'll, we'll keep the lights on the front porch. You mm -hmm. come and let us know and we'll be here to help you out. Love it. Keep the lights on, I like that. It was cute. I liked it too. It's like a bound will be well, here if you need us. That's no, no, that's uh, uh, <laughs> is that somebody's we'll slogan? Slogan? <laughs> slogan? Okay, never mind. Now that's look, not we our could slogan. probably own it because I'm sure that is such an old brand that no, nobody even remembers. What is that? It. Yeah, we'll keep the lights on for you. Uh, what Somebody is in the the chat will know it already. Oh man. Motel Six. There it is. Oh, Motel six. six. Okay, I wouldn't I remember. Mean, do we even? That's is, funny. Where's the mo type right now? Type in where is the closest Motel Six? Okay, this part's for free, guys. Where is the closest Motel Six? Are there uh, still it looks Motel like, Six? Oh, like we got one in uh, Murfreesboro, oh. Dixon, Nashville. We are just surrounded by them. Oh still man, there's a lot of dots on that what map. What was the guy's okay. name? He'd always say his name. Um, blah blah blah. Oh. We'll keep the lights on for you. I forget yeah. the spokesman's name. Okay. Maybe that part, I don't remember enough that about this. Maybe we shouldn't have be. We're, we're essentially saying we're just using somebody's trademarked line. We're probably maybe we should stay away from that. <laughs> Tom Ledet. Tom 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 Bodet. Was that his name? Was his name Tom Bodet? Oh, don't, don't ask me. I don't know. Oh, y'all have to tell me. I barely right. speak English. Let if, us that, know. if I just pulled that out of like my TBS days back as a child, oh man, that's gonna be it's awesome. It's gonna be so proud. Well, you want to do one more question? Of course. Let's go. We've got a question from Fuzzy Frank. Fuzzy Frank. Yep. He says, Is he a pink teddy bear? Purple teddy bear. What's the one in Toy Story? What? Is that oh. his name? Oh, it was his no, name Frank. I don't think it was Frank. Oh. But it makes me think of that the, the 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 teddy bear in the Toy Story. <laughs> Your mind is just an amazing thing. It's unbelievable. I overused it doing the audiobook. Okay, sorry, Fuzzy Frank. Maybe right. that just means he's like my oh. half of my dad's friends. They were all, you know, as a kid, they always had fur on their back. You know? So maybe that's what Fuzzy Frank means. All right. This thing is off the rails. I'm sorry. Fuzzy Frank, <laughs> we'll just start over with Not your question Not really now. sure what to say, so I'm just going to go back to the question. It's his name. Fuzzy Frank asks, my spouse and I both work. However, we live off my income and use hers to invest into our Roth and brokerage. 
Do we aim for a savings rate based off my income or our combined income? I like the strategy, though. I think it's smart. Both. Moving off one income, if you can do Tell that. Tell them the details. Yeah, yeah. So, so I love, I love the way y'all are doing this. We live off my, we live off of my income, and we save off of her income. That sounds great. But what if, what if you make two hundred thousand dollars a year and she makes twenty thousand dollars a year? Well, now you have a little bit of problem. So while it's great that you might be saving her income, I'd argue percentage wise, you're not saving enough. So the best way that we think to take about this is you add up both of your gross incomes and your savings rate should be based off 25% of that number. Household income. That's it. That's the one. And if you're able to do save 25% off the gross number, if it just so works out that that is 100% of her compensation, then that's great. If you make $100,000 a year and she makes $25,000 a year and you save all of her income, then that math works. But you have to make sure that you do the actual exercise so that you don't fall into the false sense of security. Oh, we're saving enough. We save all of hers and we live off of mine. You got to make sure that actual mathematically it makes sense. Well, that's what I sometimes we've had questions in the past where somebody says, man, I save 35 percent of my income. But my spouse won't save anything. What do I <laughs> tell me how to fix this? And I'm like, well, you're not really saving 35 percent. You're saving that of your income, mm-hmm. but you need to look at your household That's income. Right. And then I would now start having a conversation. It doesn't sound like Fuzzy Frank has this issue because it sounds like they've actually been very deliberate with they're going to live off one, save the rest. I just want to make sure that, that now you consolidate that into a, an actual united plan. Um, where you understand what you're working off on. That's why the net worth statement Mm -hmm. and all those things when having those romantic meals where you're actually discussing your goals and what you're, you know, what you're planning for in the future can be so beneficial to the communication of of a healthy relationship. And and I I think that you ought to think through, like when it comes to opportunities available to both of you, I would not compartmentalize, oh, well, we're just going to save off of hers. We're going to live off mine. Because what happens if like your 401k is way better than hers, True. like what if the options are better, the matching is better, the the choices are more attractive? You want to look at the absolute best options across the household, and it might be well, okay, we're going to save hers, but my 401k, we got to max that out because it is so attractive at the company I work at. Or I have access to an employee stock purchase plan. Or fill in the blank. You want to make sure you look at all of the income that comes in the household, as well as all of the saving opportunities that are available to the whole household because not all benefits packages at all employers are the same. You want to be able to pick and choose the ones that are the best. And this is not uncommon. Just because you might work for the bigger company and have the bigger comp does not mean you might have the better benefits. The smaller income may have a better benefits package that you want to figure out. How can we take advantage of that? Well, and I've even seen it getting talking about the complexity of success is that Uh, I've seen situations where the small employer is very generous, but their 401k is horrible on investment choices. So you still load it up Mm -hmm. to take advantage of the huge match um, that they have. But maybe you only buy the bond fund because that's the only fund that they had in the 401k that seemed worthy because they didn't offer index funds. They didn't offer. So that's why you really get nuanced on who, which benefits are out there what are the investment choices how's the compensation structure this is fun stuff and this is the jigsaw puzzle that is typically what we do with, with clients Reeve, i'm gonna throw this out there so that youtube cannot annihilate me for this i made a public math error and i did not catch it oh but they caught it. i think i know they what it was. You guys i are almost good. stopped you, guys are you. i was talking so fast i said hundred thousand yeah, dollars and twenty five thousand she makes twenty five thousand if you save hers that's twenty five percent you are correct the total household income would have been one hundred and twenty-five thousand. So it's not enough. So it's not enough. You, if you made seventy-five and she made twenty-five, then the math would work out. So YouTube, don't come and get me. It's public math, not my thing. It's really good at non-public math. Non-public math. Well, I don't, sweet I don't spot. think mm-hmm. public math is like spelling bee. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's I like mean, there's a lot of pressure. What? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just being put on the spot. But yeah, no, it's being put on the no, spot. No, but being yeah. put on the spot. Like if you're you can actually be good at something, but it's just when somebody makes you do something. Think about it, whenever yeah. you're trying to type an email oh, yeah. and somebody comes and stares over your shoulder oh, while yeah. and you you write your name four different times. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 kind of what public math is. Right. Is is the, you know, you just you're good at something, but the just 
the moment stress creates you making mistakes. You know what's funny about spelling bees? I bet if we went over this room, everyone kind of re can remember the word that got them out at I whatever know. age mm. it was that got them out. You don't? I never did a spelling bee. Uh, here's so what I remember. I don't out know. First round, every time we did a spell. <laughs> out every time. I mean, I just. Okay. I mean, because uh, I can't spell so anything. Maybe, so if, if what I, was your word, Bo? What quiche. got you out? Ke quiche. <laughs> quiche. Can I Starts be honest? With Q, right? Can I be honest? Still don't know that I got that I one know, down. I know. I'm like, right? oh, so shoot, I don't Q. know if Quiche. I could do that. On Why the spot? are they asking? Because I think I was like third or fourth, and I'd advanced pretty far. Like mm -hmm. I was pretty proud of it. That's the one that put me out, and that still sticks here. I got baggage from that. Uh, to this day, I don't ever put the word quiche in an email that I'm writing. <laughs> I'm also a financial advisor. Don't write a lot of quiche emails. So, <laughs> so this you saying quiche makes me think of like when we went and visited my mother-in-law most recently. I, I was like, are we gonna have food when we get there? And, and Jennifer was like, my mother, uh, she's gonna have a quiche. And I was like, for for dinner? <laughs> and I was like, because that's like eggs. It's like right, that's yeah, breakfast can, food. Well, dinner, I don't know, but dinner, uh, hey, well, breakfast for I'm dinner. not a big fan of quiches. No, I'm going to say it's because my my man Bo was was wrong uh, by the wrong. word quiche. So out of being a united front, I refuse to eat your quiche. I love it. Hey, solidarity, brother. That's right. What was? Do you remember yours? I never did a spelling bee, so I was homeschool. 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 <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that there were homeschool spelling bees. I just never did one. So, no, I don't, I don't have the this winners traumatic of a spelling memory. Bee. Oh, that's I was spared the trauma of a spelling bee. I'm not mad about it. That means your mom didn't think that you were, you were good at spelling and didn't want to put you Dina, under the homeschool she can, pressure. She can no, she probably was like, we don't need videos. to do that. We're fine. Oh, that's amazing. We'll just test them at home. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> well, all that to say, guys, this has been really, really fun. Obviously, thanks for letting us go off the rails sometimes wow we genuinely love answering your financial questions so we'll be back here tuesday 10 a.m live streaming for you and until then make sure you check out moneyguy.com there's tons of free calculators free resources archived episodes so if you have more questions or just want to keep brushing up on your finances and being motivated in your wealth building journey head to moneyguy.com we made it for you it's there even when we're not live streaming so thanks for being here and by the way, we cannot overlook the fact May 28th is still the launch date of Millionaire Mission. Yes, sir. Um, by the way, this is, we have a new and improved version of this picture that will be going up hopefully Potentially. Potentially. I love how right before the stream, he was like, well, Ruby has to approve it. Like, we're going to see yeah, if it Ruby, fits. Did, we we had now a it's a conversation like, about this, and you just spoke version. it into being. In no, I didn't. Of, I didn't mean to. millions the of people The publisher right now. sent us a nice picture. And we're considering putting it on stage. We'll see if you, it, if you it makes what sense. He, did. he said we're considering, but by him saying it right now, he just solidified no, that it has to happen. All I'm trying to do is draw May 28th, <laughs> 2024. Know about the book. I have a He's book, very my first inaugural book, be. Millionaire Mission, a nine-step system. If you go to moneyguy.com slash millionaire mission, you can level up your finances. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Reby, and the rest of the content team, Money Guy team, out. I wasn't trying to create drama.